Good morning and welcome to our family service at Cleveland Family Church. I, I hope you've had a, a terrific week and I hope you've enjoyed this lovely weather we've had these past few days. Uh, normally when I do the welcome, I like to wish people a happy birthday. But after my performance last time, I'm going to skip that part and just say happy birthday to anybody uh, whose birthday it was in the past week or in the coming week. Uh, and for those of you who may not remember, I missed my sister's birthday last time. Uh, hence, I'm hedging my bets and wishing everybody a very happy birthday. Uh, before we move on, I also would like to congratulate our football team. Uh, we won the BCFA FA Cup final last weekend. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Sam, who's going to show you a video clip of the, uh, the award ceremony at the end. We beat Woodlands 2-1. Thanks for that, Sam. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we have recommenced a midweek meeting here in the church on a Wednesday at 7 p.m. We had our first uh, meeting two weeks ago uh, on a Wednesday, as I say, seven o'clock. We had a great turnout first time and even better turnout last time. And I, can I really encourage you to think about coming along on a Wednesday night? We do, we do have to wear masks. If we have COVID symptoms, we, we mustn't come. But uh, just to have some fellowship, if we are able, has been a real blessing and I'm sure you will enjoy it if you can make it. Even if you forget your mask, we do have some masks available that we can hand out. So please, uh, can I encourage you in that? Make the effort to come along this Wednesday. It would be great to see you. Now I'm going to hand over to Dave. Dave is going to lead us in prayer. And after that, we're going to uh, sing together the hymn, Thine Be the Glory. And I've been reminded that uh, it's really good to stand. And even though you might be at home on your own, for this hymn, if you stand, I'm sure you'll get more out of it as you praise God. So we all pray together. Lord, we thank you that we can talk to you like this anytime, anywhere, and that you hear us and that you reply and you see the big picture where we don't. And or we give us patience when sometimes you don't reply in the way that we like you to. Lord, we thank you for technology that keeps us connected with friends and families, both local and across the globe. And or we pray that we won't leave anybody out in the cold. We thank you for the broadcast services that go out every week. Lord, we thank you for the fact that we can watch them and keep in touch with our friends and family at church, but also, Lord, we thank you for the people who sign on to those services and watch them that maybe never go across the door of a church, and we pray that they'll be challenged. We do pray for Luke and Claire Bolton and their tiny baby daughter. Lord, we thank you that she's been safely delivered, even though she's really small, that she's got all working parts and that she's really been looked after and cared for, and her development is being monitored by the NHS. Lord, we thank, thank you that Grant has been moved to the Re-Enablement Hospital. And Lord, we pray that the intense physio that he'll be undergoing there will heal him. Lord, we, we read so often in the Bible that you heal men like that. Lord, Peter and James did. And Lord, we thank you that you healed that lad that was let down through the roof. And we just pray for healing for Grant and also that the bungalow will sell soon. Lord, we're in the middle of COVID and it looks like getting worse again. And we just pray for your continued protection. We pray for common sense, Lord, in our dealings with other people. And we pray for the NHS that are coping and helping. And we pray that we'll, we'll just help people and be aware of their needs. And we think of the students and teachers going back to school and university right now in unusual circumstances. Help them to maintain focus and safety. And Lord, we just pray for opportunities to witness. And finally, Lord, we just pray for contacts with our neighbours and friends during these unusual times and the opportunity to share your love and friendship with them. Amen. Thank you. 
Right, children, we, we have a, a, a children's talk for you this week. And before I hand over to our very special guest, and you'll understand why this person is very special to me, uh, who knows what a mother-in-law is? Any hands up? Can I see any hands going up there? Who knows who my mother-in-law is? Well, I think quite a lot of you, but not all of you, will know that my mother-in-law lives in Bristol. And sometimes you get to see her here on a Sunday with my father-in-law. And for many years, my mother-in-law has been going around many schools in Bristol and in the region, and she tells lots and lots of Bible stories. And today, it's our turn. So a very special welcome to Annie, who's going to introduce herself to you. And she's got a very special story and a great lesson for us all to learn. Hello. I'm Granny Annie, and I'm Ella's mum. Do you remember last week Ella was talking to you about praying, about talking to God about all sorts of things, things that bother us, things that we're happy about, things that we'd like him to help us with? And this story sort of follows on from that one. It's a story about Jesus. He was on his way to Jerusalem, which is a very big city. And he was going towards a village with his 12 friends when suddenly they noticed a group of 10 men. It looked a little bit like this. Here is Jesus coming with his 12 friends. And here are the 10 men. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And the men had a problem. They had something called leprosy. And that meant they got a skin disease. It was really nasty and people didn't want to catch it. So they, as soon as they noticed it coming, they would have to go to the priest, who was a bit like the doctor in the village, and say to him, look, um, I'm afraid I've got this thing wrong with my skin. And if he didn't like the look of it, he would say, I'm sorry, you can't stay in the town anymore. You're going to have to go and live outside near the cave with all the others who might have got leprosy. It's quarantine. I'm afraid you're in lockdown for a bit. So it was very sad. They had to go out and live outside the town. Maybe there was a cave. Maybe their family would bring them some food and put it on a flat rock, but stand well clear because they weren't allowed to go near. And there was no cure in those days. Nowadays, if somebody gets leprosy, is not a problem. There's medicine and it can be mended and cured in no time. But in those days there was no help. So they called out to Jesus, Lord Jesus, please have pity on us. Lord, have mercy on us, please. And Jesus said, oh, for goodness sake, don't bother me now. I'm much too busy. Did he ever talk like that to people? No. The Bible says that he's never too busy. He never even goes to sleep. He's always listening out for us. So Jesus said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest, the doctor. Well, the only reason that they would need to do that would be if they were better. So they looked at one another and they thought, well, let's go. So they set off up the road to the village. And as they went along, one of them tripped over something. And he said, that's funny. That didn't hurt. Oh, look, my hand's better. And they looked at the, oh, look at your face. Your face is better. Oh. And as they were running along, they were getting better. And one of them turned round and he ran back down the road till he got to Jesus. When he got to Jesus, he knelt down in the road in front of Jesus and he said, Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, so much. I'm completely better. Praise God. And Jesus was thrilled, but very surprised because that man was a foreigner, not even one of his own people. And he said to him, how many people were healed? He said, ten. And how many people came back to say thank you? Only one. That's bad, isn't it? So we must remember, when we have talked to God about something, we need to say this, very important, we need to say thank you to God for the good things that he does for us. So I'd like to say a prayer now, and at the end of the prayer, you could join in with Amen if you'd like to, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all the good things that you give us. Families and homes and food and clothes and school and a lovely place to be. Help us to appreciate them. Help us to remember to look after one another and to take care of one another as best we can and your world. And thank you for mending that dear man, in fact all of them, and making them better. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening so beautifully. Maybe I'll see you again another time. Bye-bye. Thanks for that, Annie. Now everyone will know why I uh, am very appreciative of my mother-in-law. She does talks for me and everything. 
We're going to continue our morning service now with a Bible reading. Ads is going to read uh, to you from the Word of God, and then we're going to worship the Lord together. We're going to sing two songs, and the first one reminds us about how wonderful and reliable God is, such that we can literally build our lives on him and all that he is. And the second one reminds us of how God showed his love for us, coming to earth in human form and dying literally for our sins because he loved us. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 to 11. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write to you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them, as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labour pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard, not to sleep like the others. Stay alert and clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armour of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour his anger on us. Christ died for us so that, whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing.
You chose the cross with every breath, the perfect life, the perfect death. You chose the cross, the crown of thorns you wore for us and crowned us with eternal life. You chose the cross. My subject this morning I've called uh, The Believer's Duty, uh, or another heading, Until He Returns or We're Taken. Now last time I spoke on the subject of hope, and in particular the words of Jesus, which are recorded in John chapter 14, where Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled, trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home if this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. Now, at the time of this, the disciples, his followers, were deeply troubled, troubled by recent events, and they were in fear of the future. I won't rehearse exactly what it was that uh, they were worried about or for, but just the fact that they were deeply worried is enough. Uh, as part of our recap. And Jesus spoke words of encouragement to them to give them hope. Now, some of those words wouldn't sink in until later, and that is probably perhaps your experience and mine, that sometimes we can hear the word of God, and it might not have an effect now, but it will come to mind at a later stage, especially when we need it. And I think that was their experience. Their circumstances were about to get a lot worse. Jesus' crucifixion was imminent, but these words of hope would go on to have a great significance in their lives, especially once they met Jesus after he had resurrected. And that was just days away. We learned that real hope is based on five things, amongst many others, when it comes to the things of God. Firstly, faith in Jesus Christ's identity. His identity makes all the difference. Belief in him equates with belief in God. Secondly, that faith in Jesus Christ as King of Kings gives us hope as well. Heaven is his kingdom. And of course, in John 1, we read how just he spoke and everything that we see came into being. Hope is also based in the fact that we have faith in what Jesus Christ did. What did he do? Well, amongst many other things, he died and rose again for us, thereby paying the price for our sin. And we have faith through what Jesus Christ said. And he said, as we've read already, that he will return for us, which is exciting. 
And then finally, faith in Jesus Christ is something that is eternal. This goes on forever. Eternity with him is his promise. And we considered that the, the fact that the kingdom of heaven is a place and it's a kingdom, it must therefore have a king. And so there's a critical question each one of us must answer. And I ask you this morning, is Jesus Christ your king? If he's not our king, how can we expect to be a citizen? But to those that say he is, Jesus says, as we read earlier, when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And of course, that will happen in one of two ways. Either this life will end or, as he tells us on numerous occasions, he will return. Either way, he will receive us. And so Paul writes to the church in Corinthians, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. It's a, another great truth that dispels the fear of death. However, making Jesus Christ our king has major implications for this life. We don't want to wish this life away. There are things that God has for us to do. And Paul writes to the church, we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our saviour. Do you get the, the emphasis, the point here that he is saying we are already citizens of the kingdom of heaven, if he is our king? And so if we're eagerly awaiting his return, it, it ought to be apparent. I was thinking, well, what, what would demonstrate to somebody else that I was eagerly awaiting his return? And that's what I'd like you and myself to think about this morning. Because in our main reading, Paul's emphasis is on Christ's return. And scripture tells us that when he does return, he's coming to judge. And that's why we must be prepared and we wish to share the good news that we can be prepared, that we can be ready to meet the Lord Jesus. Firstly, we should be expectant. Verse four, you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief, for you are children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So Paul is saying here that believers aren't going to be caught by surprise by the return of Christ. Why, why would that be? Four reasons. Firstly, because we're not in darkness. We can see what's going on around us and scripture tells us what to look for and for us to be ready. And we can look at this on another occasion, but look for yourself. Look at what scripture says about signs of the times, things that will be portents of the return of Jesus Christ. And therefore, it's little wonder that Paul says to us, we're not in darkness, we can be ready and waiting and aware of his return based on what we see. Secondly, we're not living in darkness. And he's talking here about our, our conduct. We're aware of God's holiness and his light and we follow it. Thirdly, because we're children of light. Of course, God is the light and we're his children. Therefore, we are also of the light. When we become followers of, of Christ, we become part of his kingdom, the kingdom of light, you might say, and we live in his light. And he also says, because we're children of the day. In other words, we won't be condemned by judgment, as will children of the night. A good illustration for you. I don't know if you know what a, a lunar moth is or a fire beetle or a firefly. I, I was watching a, a great program on, on planet Earth the other night and it, it showed one of these kinds of fireflies flying in the dark and there were thousands of them and it looked absolutely spectacular. And you could see them, they stood out. Uh, it was dark and I'm sure they were surrounded by many other similar kinds of animals or insects, but only they stood out. They glow in the dark, they stand out at night. And I think uh, the analogy is this. At the moment, we are all mingled together, aren't we? People who are living in the light and those who live in darkness. And those with the light stand out. 
don't they? But a time is coming when those with the light will be separated from those who choose to remain in darkness. If that sounds depressing, if you're concerned, let me tell you that Jesus holds out an olive branch to anyone who's willing to make that switch from darkness into his kingdom of light. In John chapter 8, we read Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And to those that respond positively to that invitation, scripture reminds us in the book of Ephesians, once you were full of darkness, past tense, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. A day of reckoning is coming and Paul tells us to be expectant of it and ready. Next, he tells us that we should be on duty, on our guard. He says in verse six from our reading, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to bed at a sensible time and getting a good night's sleep. But clearly, Paul is on about something else. He's talking about being spiritually asleep, unaware of what's going on around us, oblivious, perhaps, to the change in this world as we see it spiraling, you might say, into ever uh, increasing degrees of darkness, or so it would seem, unaware of what God is doing. Other symptoms I think of being asleep as a Christian, as a believer, would include ignoring prayer, ignoring fellowship, ignoring God's word, not being ready, maybe not even wanting it, maybe not wanting the Lord to return, because we quite enjoy being asleep in this world. Suffice to say, it's not a compliment to be considered asleep. Something else associated with sleep is the night. And it's usually at night time when sin creeps in. So to be spiritually asleep like others, as Paul writes here, implies a life of compromise. And so Paul warns us to be on our guard, alert and awake, so that we're ready for the occasion for which many others will be completely unexpecting. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, so you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Next, we should protect ourselves. I'm fully aware of the need to be properly equipped based on my personal experience of being called up to the British Army when I was 22 years old. I, uh, I received this letter from the Ministry of Defence and I, I thought I'd read it to you. It says, dear Mr. Douglas, Notification of compulsory enlistment. Under the Emergency Powers Act 1939, you are hereby notified that you are required to place yourself on standby for immediate compulsory military service. You may shortly be ordered to depart for theatre, where we, you will join either the 3rd Battalion of the Queen's Own Suicidal Conscripts or the 2nd Foot and Mouth. Because of cutbacks in government expenditure in recent years, it will be necessary for you to provide yourself with the following equipment as soon as possible. Tin hat, combat trousers and jacket, Dunlop daps, gas mask or a canary, travel scrabble, cans of spam, suntan oil factor 50. We should like to reassure you that in the unlikely event of anything going wrong, you will receive a free burial in a graveyard of your choice. There may be little time for formal military training before your departure, and so we advise that you should watch the following films for tips. The Guns of Navarone, A Bridge Too Far, The Longest Day. All the best, your sincerely, Jeff Hoon, Defence Secretary. Well, I'm sure you would agree with me that these requirements were hardly going to stand me in good stead for war, and fortunately in the event I wasn't called up to active service. But it's interesting how Paul often uses military terms to describe the Christian walk. 
and how he talks about how we are protected. As our light inevitably stands out in a dark world, we can become a target. And he says in our reading, let us who live in the light be clear headed, protected by the armor of faith and love and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. We're not expected to be unarmed guards. On the contrary, we're equipped by God to stand our ground and emit his light in a world of darkness. And Paul describes the armour in the New King James uh, Version. It, he refers to the breastplate of faith and love. And what's the, the main part of the body that the breastplate protects? It, it's the heart, isn't it? The heart symbolizing our passion, our, our commitment, loyalty, our focus, our cause, our motivation for being, which should be focused on him, our faith and love. When our hearts are focused on him, that's when we live rightly before him as any citizen of his kingdom should. And so often as believers, we might neglect this and wonder why life doesn't meet expectations, why it is that we are vulnerable and it seems like we are unarmed, ill-equipped, and it doesn't have to be that way. It's faith, it's also a matter of love, love which protects our hearts when we remember what he's done for us. Do we have love? I thank God that scripture tells us that he first loved us and our response to him and his love should be love. And it's that is what sort of cements that relationship that protects us in our faith, combined the two together, love and faith. And then he talks about what he calls the helmet of salvation. What does a soldier's helmet protect? Well, Paul's talking about the mind. He protects our mind. We contemplate our hope for the future in our minds, don't we? And when we think about what God plans for us for in eternity, it enables us to live in the moment in a different way. Short-term kicks and thrills become insignificant when we see the glory that awaits us. And our faith is entirely rational. You don't have to throw your mind out in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus, we read in chapter two, the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. I hope you picked up the deity of Christ just in that last sentence. Our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. In light of that, there's really no excuse for us to be asleep, is there? Especially having received the wake up call from God. Finally, we're all on call. Verse 11. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So there's an expectation here that believers will encourage and build one another up. And we have to ask ourselves that question. Is that what we're doing? If the answer is yes, keep, keep at it, keep doing that. If the answer is no, start. If the answer is sometimes, well, make it more, re more regular, make it often. It's a good habit. It's certainly not the job of the pastor or the vicar or the church leadership or group leaders or Sunday school teachers. It's everybody's job. It's definitely a team game. There's a team game aspect to our faith and we are all expected to do our part. And as we read, Paul's audience was doing this already, but he asks them, he pleads with them to keep going. And on another occasion, Paul writes to the church, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, 
we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. We have the saying, don't we, charity begins at home, and and Paul is picking this principle up in his writings. We do need to, to get this right in the home. We need to get this right within our circle, within our church group, within our church family, those within the family of faith and beyond. And so the expectation is that we we get the fundamentals right with our immediate relationships and then we can work outwards. And the ways that we can encourage and edify one another are numerous, but the consequences will be the same. People will be strengthened. They will be built up by yours and my example, as well as through our practical help. And Jesus makes it plain that the limit, or rather the scope, is limitless. He says these words, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So let's just wrap this up this morning. To finish, let's be expectant of the Lord's return, however that may be for us. Whether we meet him in the prime of life or at the end, we need to be ready. Let's be on duty and on guard. We ought to be able to recognise the signs of the times going on around us. We ought to be able to recognise God's plans and purposes at work. And let's protect our hearts and minds with faith, love and an appreciation of our salvation and what it cost in order that we might have it. And finally, let's respond to that call of duty. There are needs within the fellowship for practical help and an example, as well as in the world. Let's be the one that responds to that call. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, If anybody tuning in uh, has questions, please feel free to email me at uh, richard.douglas at chadwickholdings.co.uk. Please try and make it on Wednesday here at seven o'clock. If you need uh, some practical help or prayer, please go to our church website, clevelandfamilychurch.org. There will be contact details there for you and you can reach out to us and someone will follow up with you directly. Please can I also encourage you to check the Facebook page. We are planning a return to what we might call proper church on a Sunday morning soon. And uh, so you need to be looking out for announcements. But we're going to close our morning service together. We're going to sing that song, Be Thou My Vision. And as I said before, I'd like to encourage you to stand, even if you haven't done it before, if you're able, and sing this hymn together as we close.
So let's finish with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.